Welcome to Accommodating Diverse Learners, a webinar brought to you by the Academy for Teaching Excellence at Harper College. My name is Melissa Basinger, and I'm an Instructional Design Specialist in the Academy. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for this webinar, Pascuala Herrera and Debbie Reuter. Pascuala is a professor and accessibility specialist here at Harper and has been with Harper since 1991. Pascuala has a master's degree in education in reading, learning disabilities, and bilingual education from DePaul University. In her role as accessibility specialist, Pascuala has assisted thousands of students by conducting intake interviews, determining legal accommodations, and providing support for students. She also instructs in the classroom by teaching first year experience and humanistic psychology courses. She is a frequent local and national presenter on the topic of disability awareness, motivation, and the importance of education for Latino students. As a Latina disabled woman, Pascuala inspires and motivates students in working toward achieving their aspirations in spite of the challenges they may face. Debbie Reuter is in her eighth year at Harper and works as the Accessibility Outreach Specialist. She has a master's in school and community counseling at National U.S. University and is a licensed clinical professional counselor. Debbie has been an adjunct faculty member at National Lewis University, Elgin Community College, and here at Harper. One of her areas of interest at Harper has been universal design for learning principles, which allows for more equitable classroom instruction for diverse learners. She has attended the Center for Applied Special Technology, or CAST, UDL Presenters Academy in Massachusetts, UDL IRN Summit in 2017, is a diversity and inclusion facilitator, and is a co-facilitator of the Harper UDL Community of Practice. Welcome, Pasquala and Debbie, and thank you so much for being here today. I'll now turn it over to Pasquala, who will take us through the agenda for our presentation today. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited about spending the next hour with you discussing how we can make each classroom an accessible environment to make learning equitable for each diverse learner. Before we get started, I want to briefly go over the agenda. I will be covering the first half, followed by my colleague, Debbie. We will begin with a general overview of the two laws, Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, that public colleges such as Harper must follow. Next, we will define disability and explore not only our own attitudes about disabilities, but the attitudes that students might have about their own disability. We will then move on to discussing the appropriate use of language that is inclusive and not hurtful when we talk about disabilities. Debbie will then go over the social model versus the medical model, followed with some information about universal design. We will conclude this webinar with going over specifically what Access and Disability Services, ADS, at Harper can do. Let me begin by stating that the laws that govern college is very different than the K through 12 laws. Elementary and high schools must provide a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment and must create an individualized educational plan known as IEP. Once the student receives his or her diploma, that right ends. When they enter college, if the college receives any type of federal funding, the college must follow the ADA, which was signed into law in 1990, in addition to Section 504. These laws guarantee that any individual with a disability is entitled to and has the right to access. Please note, the law does not guarantee success. So unlike high school, colleges do not have to create an individualized educational plan. The law must ensure that students have access, 
but the student must still meet the outcomes or other curricular expectations with or without disabilities. Besides having to meet the same expectations, students must meet the same admission requirement as all other students. Though Harper is an open door admission institution, other colleges that have admission criteria cannot admit or deny admission based on a disability. For example, I have a physical disability and attended DePaul University for my undergraduate and graduate education. DePaul could not use my disability to deny admission, nor could not waive me from meeting any admission requirement because of my disability. The law requires colleges to have an office such as ADS at Harper. It is the student's responsibility to reach out to such office for requesting accommodation. Later, when we talk about defining disabilities, you will understand why some students choose to delay the disclosure of a disability and will not register until there is an academic problem such as being on academic probation. Still, it is up to each student to request accommodation, and we cannot require them to utilize what they are entitled to receive by law. Offices such as ADS are designated by the college to determine and approve reasonable accommodation. ADS developed and uses a comprehensive in intake interview and will determine the accommodations based on the interview and the review of any medical, educational, or psychological dem documentation that is provided. Therefore, accommodations are given only when it is determined that the disability poses a functional limitation and therefore requires accommodation to have full access in the classroom. For example, if a student has a disability that impacts his ability to focus and concentrate, then a note taker is a reasonable accommodation if the law require, if the class requires sustained attention and note taking. Once the accommodations are approved, the student can send out their approved accommodation to each of their professors via their student portal. The faculty will get an email outlining the accommodation the student is approved for in the class. The email will not disclose the nature of the disability since it's entirely up to the student to disclose. We encourage students to talk to faculty privately and to share information that might help them be more successful. Students with disabilities must be held to the same standards. The law just ensures access, but faculty should still hold the student responsible for the same expectation as the other students without disabilities. I know that faculty want all students to succeed, but modifying curriculum or changing expectation is not required or even beneficial for students with disabilities. A good rule of thumb is to ask yourself, would I make this allowance or change for any student even without a disability? If the answer is no, then know that the change you are about to make goes beyond what the law requires. The law requires faculty to even the playing field, not to give an unfair advantage. Finally, I want to stress that the student is responsible to request accommodations and to follow the procedures to obtain them. For example, if a student sends their accommodation notification that likely includes extended time on testing, but never schedules their alternative testing, it is not the faculty's responsibility to ensure that the student gets extended time it's up to the student to arrange for the accommodation. Now that I generally covered the law, I want us to shift our thinking a little to understand the attitudes of students with disabilities 
and likewise to hopefully understand our own attitudes. This understanding will assist in the implementation of the law. The law provides us with a definition of disability that states, an individual with a disability is a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, a person who has a history or record of such impairment, or a person who is perceived by others as having such impairment. The law defines disability very broadly. At the college setting, life activities may include writing, reading, paying attention, taking notes, taking time tests, etc. If the student affects, if the disability affects one of these areas, it may be mitigated by the provision of an accommodation. The accommodation, therefore, would provide access. However, in true application, if you were to look up the word disability in a thesaurus, you will find a totally different definition. As the illustration on this slide shows, just by looking up synonyms for the word disability, the results show very harsh and negative words. Words such as unable, incapable, dependent, and other words that are found in some thesauruses are clearly not how I would describe myself as a person with a disability, though I might have believed that when I was younger. So it should not be surprising that students will come to Harper carrying the stigma of the label of disability. And when students with invisible disabilities quickly realize that disclosure is entirely up to them, they will hold this information in secrecy until it must be disclosed due to a poor academic progress. Unfortunately, many students have experienced the negative effects of these words. Their attitude is affected, causing them to lower their own expectations and to struggle with having confidence. Likewise, I wonder if these words also affect our own attitudes about disabilities. Definitely, the synonyms reflect the overall view of disability. However, our own attitude about disabilities is formed in other different ways. One of the major ways that our knowledge and understanding about disability is formed is based on our own experiences with a disability or knowing a family member or family member or friend with a disability. I'd like to take a poll now and have you indicate whether you know or a friend or family member with a disability by choosing yes or no. All right, here are the results of our poll are coming up. Okay. Everybody that responded said yes. Okay, so for those that responded yes, which is everyone, I would bet that your viewpoints about disability was affected by this experience. Definitely our own experiences greatly influence our comfort and sensitivity when interacting with individuals with disabilities. The attitudes formed based on experiences can both be positive and negative. For example, if you are a parent of a child with ADHD, LD, etc., you, you may be more comfortable and empathetic with students with these disabilities in your classes. However, if your experience with disability is a troublesome student who made your semester so difficult, your attitude about disability may have been influenced by this inappropriate behavior of one student. Keep in mind, a disability does not prohibit a person from being a jerk. However, we cannot fully use uh, fall into this trap in attributing this perception at every student with a disability. Family and friends greatly influence our attitudes about disability. Prior to the 1990s, when the ADA was signed, 
disability was less visible in the mainstream society. Some individuals never interacted with others with disabilities unless a family or close friend had a disability. Their lack of exposure and experience may influence their own acceptance and in turn influence yours. My mother only experienced with disability was me. So her whole understanding of disability is wheelchairs. As much as I share about various disabilities, she cannot grasp this information. Also, disabilities are viewed differently in some cultures, such as mine, Mexican. Our attitudes are also affected by the depiction of disability in the mainstream. Think of older movies when the message was that death was preferable than a disability, or that a person hated life until a miracle ridding of the disability was found. I, for one, do not wake up each day hating my life with a disability. I have never prayed for a miracle cure. In fact, I forget about my disability until I encounter an environmental or attitudinal barrier that reminds me of my disability. However, this is what we've been fed over and over by popular media. Times are changing and the depiction of disability in the mainstream media is improving as evidenced by new television shows um, that demonstrate how a disability makes a life different but not necessarily worse. Disability is the largest growing minority group in the United States. It does not discriminate against race, gender, age, social economic class, etc. Either by birth, accident, or disease, a person can join the disability community at any time. This truth makes disability the most discriminated form of diversity. Perhaps because of our own vulnerability and realizing that we, cannot be, that we can become disabled at any time, we may avoid individuals with disabilities who may remind us of our own privilege. <clears throat> because disability may result from birth, accident, or disease, it's understandable that the disability identity will vary from person to person. The identity of a person born with a disability depends greatly on the family and environment around them. Their life has always been with a disability, but the attitude might be affected by the way the family reacted to them. If the person is raised being overprotected or pitied, then it is likely they will have this viewpoint. On the other hand, if they were raised to believe they could be successful in spite of a disability, they will not view their condition as a negative, but rather as part of who they are. Those individuals who become disabled by accident will adjust to their disability differently. Not only will they can have to contend with the disability and what this means in their life, but they will undergo a loss of what life used to be. This is an individual process and such like, much like grief, the time it takes is different. Often a feeling of anger and disappointment must be addressed prior to being able to adjust to the disability. Individuals who are affected and become disabled by disease also have to adjust differently. Depending on the onset of the condition, the person will need to adjust to a different lifestyle than they are accustomed to. Individuals with chronic illness often have to become experts of their own condition and learn terminology that is required for them to manage their disability. Adjustment di difficulties include having to manage a schedule based on their condition, having to manage different medical appointments and procedures, 
and having to manage an interruption of their plans caused by a worsening of the disability. As much as they may try to take control, often their disability is in control of their life. Regardless of reasons for the disability, it's important to acknowledge that not every student will be contending with the same challenges. Faculty and staff will not always know the story behind the individual, but having the sensitivity and understanding how disability identity varies will allow for more understanding and inclusive environment. The key to understanding exactly all that the student is dealing with in their life is building relationship with students. As we all know, language is very powerful. However, language is also ever-changing. It is easy to fear saying the wrong thing and offending someone unintentionally. Whereas it's true that language constantly changes, one key suggestion I have for you when talking about an individual with a disability is to always use people-first language. The disability is the object, but the person is the subject. In this chart, you will notice that the person is always first, followed by the condition. Note that the changes in terminology are also related to history. The first row shows unacceptable words that I'm sure you have seen, such as crippled and handicapped. The word cripple is used biblically, and historically, a disability was viewed as a curse or punishment. Today, the word cripple is very negative and should be avoided. Likewise, the word handicap has a historical background. After World War II, many veterans who came back disabled were forced to the streets due to lack of governmental support. It is said that these disabled vets would use their military caps and beg for money. The word handicap came from these vets having a handy cap for these purposes. Today, the word handicap should be used only when describing an object such as parking space or a bathroom. It should never be used to describe a person. The correct terminology is to say a person with a disability. Also, when speaking about individuals without disabilities, you should say just that. Avoid using comparative language such as normal or healthy. The third row shows, uh, um, points out how a wheelchair is just a tool that a person with a physical disability might use. Always focus on the person in the chair. No individual is bound or confined to a wheelchair, since in fact the wheelchair is the opposite in that it provides mobility and independence. Wheelchair users like myself see the chair as a wonderful tool that has provided the opportunity to get around as quick as or even quicker than those who walk. I am by no means bound to it. I do not sleep in this thing, nor confined to it since it provides liberty instead of confinement. The fourth row points out how recently the DSM considered autism as a spectrum disorder. Some students may have severe autism, yet others may be high functioning. Again, refer to the person first instead of posing a label clumping all students together as autistic. The fifth row points out how the correct terminology when referring to an individual who is deaf or hard of hearing. The deaf and hard of hearing committee does not view their condition as a disability. They consider themselves as member of a culture that has its own language, customs, and activities. Avoid using hearing impaired because they do not view their lack of hearing as an impairment. 
Rather, they view themselves as culturally different. Do not use the word deaf mute since it's very derogatory. Whereas the deaf and hard of hearing community does not use the word impairment, individuals who are blind do view themselves as having vision loss and therefore being visually impaired. Again, focus on the person first. When, in the, when referring to individuals who have low intellectual ability, I hope we all know to avoid the R word. The correct terminology is to say the person has an intellectual or cognitive disability. Likewise, words such as crazy or mental are offensive when referring to individuals with psychological disability. I had to include language about my own disability. When I was nine months old, I contracted polio. I do not view myself as afflicted or a victim of it, but rather I'm a survivor of this disease. It is one of my greatest pet peeves when they refer to me as being a victim of polio. The other examples are pretty self-explanatory. The bottom line, you will be safe if you use people first language. Do not be afraid of making mistakes that you avoid approaching a person with a disability. Individuals with disabilities will likely know if it was an honest mistake and possibly might even correct your language. When this happens, try not to be offended and remember that it is through mistakes that we learn. Before I hand it over to Debbie to continue this webinar, I want to make sure you're aware that we will take questions at the end. Please jot down any questions you have so far or post them in the chat area for Melissa to collect, and I will be happy to respond at the end. Debbie? Thank you, Pasquala, for sharing your vast knowledge and personal experiences. As you experienced with the exercise of defining disability, identity, and people-first language slides, you can see how the medical model has created a pervasive and negative perception of disability. When we focus on the person as disabled and the need to fix them, we are promoting ableism and the idea that the person with the disability is the problem. If we shift the responsibility to society and use the social model, we can see that it is all of our responsibility to be inclusive, that fixing the environment and attitudes will create the type of environment where we all feel included and valued. I recently attended an AHEAD Institute for Disability Professionals in Higher Education. The presenter, Melanie Thornton, shared some wonderful work she and other leaders in our field have created through a federal grant from the U.S. Department of Education and the Institute for Human-Centered Design. This project presents their core values, as you see here, that are intended to help guide higher education in the social justice work and distributed responsibility model of access. I have shared this link at the end of the presentation for you to look at the resources and help us shift our campus environment to a model that is equitable for the variety of students that we have on campus. Individuals with disabilities need to be included in our diversity and inclusion conversations. Now we'll move on to how Universal Design for Learning can provide options that reduce barriers in the environment for all and can eliminate the need for some accommodations. I'm wondering, are any of you familiar or currently using Universal Design for Learning principles in your classroom? And I have opened up a polling slide. All right, I'm closing the poll. Looks like we're about half and half in our responders. Okay, great. That's about what I expected. It's great to see that some of you are uh, familiar and using Universal Design for Learning. But as I have experienced, there's always more to learn when shifting to Universal Design. I will review some of this framework, and there will be resources again made available at the end of the presentation for you to learn more. Universal Design for Learning is an educational framework developed in 1984 by CAST, 
co-founders and educational researchers, Ann Meyer and David Rose from Harvard School of Education. UDL and Universal Design for Instruction grew out of the universal design movement in architecture and commercial products, which emphasizes design and usability for the broadest range of people. The social model influenced this paradigm shift. It is the environment that is disabled, not the student. This framework recognizes that we need to be proactive and creative, including creating inclusive um, classroom environments because variability is the norm, not the exception. Beginning with clear goals is a good place to evaluate what outcomes are we really trying to accomplish. UDL shifts instruction from acquiring content knowledge to teaching students how to become expert learners because we know that employers are looking for employees who can think critically and problem solve. We also know that our community college students are more diverse than ever. Many students who received accommodations from the time they were in grade school are gaining access to higher education, along with students with psychological disabilities, students who are other language learners, work full-time jobs, returning veterans, and varying educational backgrounds, or any other number of variables that impact our students. It's a matter of equity and access to create learning opportunities and design the classroom environment in a manner that offers students options to engage with material, options for representation, and options for active learning. UDL creates the optimum environment for learning by recognizing that learning is dynamic and given the right conditions, we can all thrive. Many of you are probably familiar with what Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset that students can achieve with effort and the right amount of challenge. We can also reduce barriers to learning while still maintaining high standards. Also, Malcolm Gladwell recognized in his research that practice actually does make perfect. So with the right tools and practice, students can become expert learners. And we as educators also grow in our ability to design educational environments that are not disabled and reach our diverse learners. So UDL is based on the neuroscience of learning, and what researchers have discovered is that there are different cognitive learning networks. Our affective network, the why of learning, recognizes the need to engage students in the material. Also, students' own affect can influence learning. For example, students who believe that they cannot perform well in a subject area like math often do not perform well due to the anxiety. Creating an open, supportive classroom environment can help students feel more confident and engaged. The recognition network, or what of learning, is the opportunity to appeal to the many different ways students comprehend and access material. Some students are more auditory, others more visual, and we all need to have material presented in a variety of ways with options that provide for better comprehension and provide background knowledge. The strategic network, or how of learning, are the ways that students express their knowledge. This can give students many different options to express what they've learned by using different technologies or varying methods of assessment. As you can see, all of these designs have benefits for all users, not just individuals with disabilities. I am sure we can all imagine the ways in which these designs have reduced barriers for all of us. Let's choose curve cuts to discuss. I wonder if we can pull again and see how do we all benefit from this design. So if you think about curb cuts, and we showed the picture of one on the previous slide, why do we have curb cuts? So Marcy had said for persons who are blind or have vision impairments. Great, exactly. Curb cuts help us when we need to have access to getting onto the sidewalk. Absolutely. Marcy also said for strollers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marcy. OK, 
Can you imagine a stroller without a curb cut? Oh, I know. Oh my gosh, what? What? <laughs> Segways. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I know for me, just when you're traveling at the airport, getting your suitcase, if it's really heavy, up. Oh, and absolutely. Actually, they don't have a curb cut at the long-term parking at O'Hare. And, and you it's really, really tough. It. Yeah. Cheryl said, because you created curbs that prevent from some way getting around, um, from getting around in the same way. Um, Rita Guerra said, wheelchairs, walkers, easier to ascend and descend without the height change. And Jason responded for the elderly. Great. Thank you, everybody, That's for great. your input. Thank you. All of these are great examples of why sometimes the design, which is created for one particular reason, ends up offering a lot of us different advantages, just like how we can design our classrooms. So the UDL guidelines offer options for developing curriculum that addresses learner variability. Some things that Harper faculty have done to implement UDL and engage students have been teaching students about the principles themselves so they can reflect on how they learn best and can take a more active role in their own learning. Another way a faculty member implements a representation guideline and provides options for comprehension is providing guided notes, which helps all students, but particularly helps students with ADHD and anxiety who may not catch everything in a lecture or who get distracted easily. Other examples of UDL are flipping the classroom to provide for more active learning. You can evaluate your syllabus to create an atmosphere of open communication and accessibility up front. Our most recent faculty fellow and my co-leader of the community practice she created an accessible, interactive syllabus, almost like an invitation to her classroom. There are many ways to get to the end goal. Just like when we're using our GPS system for driving, there are a variety of ways to get to the city of Chicago. For some, public transportation is the best option, while driving on an expressway may be the quickest route for some. Others might find it too stressful, so taking alternative routes works best. Many of these options may be different, some may take longer, but they all get us where we want to go. Our office serves close to 1,400 students with all types of disabilities. We meet with students for comprehensive intake, look at documentation, and determine what's the best accommodation with the student to create access. We value our faculty partners who work to create an accessible classroom environment. It is great when students feel comfortable talking to their instructors, know where to find our office, ask for accommodations, and have a discussion with faculty about how to implement that accommodation. It is so important that we have allies on campus who know that student inclusion is a shared responsibility. Thank you so much, Pasquale and Debbie, for your fantastic presentations. Um, at this time, I would like to invite all of you participating to type any questions that you have for Pasquale, Debbie, or both of them into the chat box. We have a question from Marcy. She asks, some instructors have been concerned about uploading notes and also about ADS providing note takers because they consider taking notes as part of the learning process. Can you comment on this? Well, uh, because a disability may impact their ability to process auditory information, providing a note taker is considered a legal accommodation because it provides access to their inability to take notes. Since we know that notes are very important when preparing for exams or doing well in the class. So the response would be that if we don't allow a note taker or provide that as access, then we are setting up the student for an unequal, unequitable experience in the classroom. Another way to address this from a universal design perspective, um, at Harvard in their School of Education, David Rose's class had different students post their notes to a Blackboard show. And this allows for people with different learning styles 
to see what there's something that maybe they missed and somebody else took. So it offers people an opportunity to view how other people learn, how they learn, and maybe find some other creative ways. So those are some options that instructors can employ by having students more engaged in the classroom and have them post a variety of different notes to the Blackboard shelf. It's a win-win if that's done. That's fantastic. I also would like to comment that a lot of times when people question an accommodation, for good reasons, they question about whether it's fair, you know, and whether it's fair that this student is getting something that the next student is not getting. And what I like to always explain is that sometimes equality is not equitable. Treating every student the same way sometimes is unfair for some students. So having a clear understanding of the difference between equity and equality would be a really good thing to know. That's great. While we're waiting for uh, any other questions to come in, um, I think the example that you gave about the student or the, um, the faculty member at, was it Harvard? Mm -hmm. or, um, again, I like that because for faculty, that's something they can get the students involved in, and that's not difficult to mm -hmm. do. Um, do you have any other recommendations, or have you run into other kind of easy things to do to incorporate UDL in the classroom? Like, if you're going to take a first step, do you see any other really great examples? Uh, well, I really, I really did like the, um, just taking a look at your syllabus as a first step. Right. You know, taking a look at what's the environment you're setting up for your students and realizing that that's a good way for you to create an open door with your students and not make it quite as intimidating um, so that they can come to you and have those discussions. I think the guided notes even from faculty for some who are concerned about a class that ha is so content rich offers all of us different ways to see the information and still engage with it and write in notes with some blank pieces within the guided that's notes. Great. It takes a little bit more effort up front, but I think that's the thing with universal design. Sometimes it just takes a little bit more effort up front to be prepared for the kinds of situations that might arise, but it's being proactive and then it's Absolutely. less work later on. Absolutely. When I was teaching accounting, I did guided notes. I didn't even think about that as being mm -hmm. a good UDL. It was a lot of upfront work, but it was great. The students really liked it. Students of all different like ability levels, and um, I think it, it it helped a lot. Um, Jason has a question as well. Can you please elaborate on how other students benefit from accessible media, such as caption videos, and the process we go through to caption the video? Thanks. Any tips you can offer to the faculty members would be great. Well, uh, I know that English is my second language, and so I know the benefits just from a language point of view that captioning does um, for those that are learning a language. Um, it also really helps uh, the person having multiple modalities, uh, you know, having the visual along with the auditory. So it would benefit you know, all students, I think, to have that option to use both. As far as how uh, faculty can do, uh, I'd like to say that first, you know, attempting, attempting to choose videos that are already captioned would be a really good first step. So it, I know that YouTube um, will have a link where you can um, look and see if the captioning works. Sometimes the captioning is not super accurate, but it's um, sometimes it is. Also, ADS, uh, there is a method for faculty to work with access and disability services, particularly if videos are going to be used uh, frequently and every semester. Thank you for that. So at this time, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And if you found today's session valuable, um, you will definitely not want to miss the 2018 GEC, Creating an Accessible Learning Environment for Students with Disabilities. So this GEC is facilitated by Pasquala, 
and it received rave reviews after its first offering in fall 2017. So it will be offered again, either in the summer or in the fall. So keep an eye out in the Academy newsletter and on the Academy website for information and registration. Uh, this is a not to be missed GEC opportunity. Um, at this time, I want to thank Pasquale and Debbie very much for their time and informative presentation today. Um, I would also like to thank Don and Yolanda from Caption Consulting for their wonderful captioning services. And also a big thank you to all of our attendees, both in our live session and for those of you watching this recording uh, after the fact. Uh, the recording, along with all the related resources, will be emailed out to all registrants in about a week and will also be made available on the Academy for Teaching Excellence website at that time. And again, thank you so much, Debbie and Pasquale, for your fantastic presentations. So thank you all, everyone. We are going to sign off now. Have a fantastic day.